There's a couple people who I know are generally here. I don't see the room yet. I have to rush across campus from the 430. Last, I'm supposed to end at 420. And walk in here a few minutes late. But as you can see, I have to walk right down, but don't worry about it. Okay. Oh, uh, today I'm welcome to, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Kent Siemens to give the Serious Security Seminar for March 23rd. Uh, Dr. Siemens is a professor at Brigham Young University where he directs the Internet Security Research Lab. Uh, he actually started his academic career at Brigham Young as an undergrad, but uh, this is in a sense coming home, close to home for him. He did his PhD work at the University of Illinois, uh, working in computer security. After that, went to Pittsburgh. Uh, worked with uh, IBM Research. I don't know, were you at TransArc before it became IBM? I or? was, yep. Yeah, IBM. So with TransArc uh, and IBM, and then uh, moved from there back into academia and to Brigham Young. And uh, actually, Dr. Siemens does a, a wide variety of work in, uh, in security, ranging from trust negotiation to, uh, to kind of internet security issues, and but today he's going to talk to us about usable security, and some issues in us, usable security. So, Dr. Siemens. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chris. It's a real pleasure for me to, to be here with you today. I gave a talk here about 10 years ago on trust negotiation, so uh, it's good to be back. And I really look forward to telling you about some of the usable security work uh, we've been doing in the research lab at BYU. Um, this is a collaborative effort. I collaborate with Dr. Zapala, also in the department, and a number of students. Much of this work is from Scott Rudy as part of his PhD work, and a number of other students have made important contributions. Um, the research in our lab is funded by NSF and a Google faculty award. Uh, Sandia also supports a number of our students. I want to spend the first part of the talk sort of introducing you to use the field of usable security if you're not already uh, familiar with it. And part of the goal I have here is you know, if you're a system security person or someone interested in security, you might develop systems, you might evaluate systems. And I want to convince you in the next few minutes that you should care about usable security. And this is, this is something that, that, that maybe you, you should pay attention to what that community is doing or maybe involve that community in your own security efforts. So usable security is sort of where security meets, meets HCI or human computer interaction. I mean, so many applications involve humans, attackers try to exploit humans. And the thing I believe that distinguishes usable security from just traditional usability is this kind of the security issue, because security is usually not the primary task of the users, as hard as, as that is for us security folks to, to believe. Uh, but you know, users want to get jobs done, and security is important to them, but it's usually in the background. And that, that makes some of the usability issues uh, different. And usable security, I think it brings together traditional security folks. I mean, I'm a system security person who's moved into usable security, but also HCI. Uh, folks have important contributions to make, and we're even collaborating more and more with people from the social sciences. So I think it's kind of the, the kind of the bringing together of these three uh, communities. So security needs to be convenient, or people will bypass it. This is a fun picture that circulated in the usable security community a few, few years ago. And if, if you can notice it, here's a there's a little gate here across this street. I have no idea why it's there, but as you can see, people are just sort of ignoring it. Well, that's what can happen in our systems. Uh, Gutman and Grieg made the following. Uh, comment about 10 years ago. They said, we spent the 90s building and deploying security that wasn't really needed. And now that it's actually desirable, we're finding that nobody can use it. And in many ways, I think that statement is still true today. Uh, Don Norman said, the more secure you make something, the less secure it becomes. And what he was sort of hinting at, he said, he was kind of a cynical comment is, geez, w when we make our security system so complex and so burdensome to users, they find ways you know, to break that security, right? Turn it off or get, get around it somehow. Um, so I, there seems to be a trade-off between usability and security. And we don't really know that relationship. So I want this, this graph more to raise the question for you, not, not to imply that, 
this line is, is exactly that trade-off. I mean, we sort of don't know. We, we, we see instances where it seems like when you make something really, really secure, you sacrifice usability. And sometimes it seems like if we get rid of security, we make something uh, highly usable. But I think we're still trying to figure out uh, uh, th this relationship. Now, I do secure email work, and you may be familiar with PGP, is kind of a, maybe a, a tool that's been around for a while. And security folks with public key encryption, we like that we think of that as being a really secure system. And there's user studies that demonstrate it's not very usable to average users. So maybe it should sit here on this diagram. But if users use it and they don't know how to use it and they make mistakes, then we might sort of make the argument that really PGP offers no security. Okay, and in fact, it, it may, you may be in worse shape if you actually start using it and think you can send a secure message and you do it, do it in, in, incorrectly. And maybe ideally is, can we construct a system so that it could be both usable and secure? I think that's kind of the grand challenge. Uh, so this is the, the kind of things we, we've been thinking about. So why should you care? Well, because as security experts, we can design systems that aren't usable. We have sort of ample evidence of that. And usability analysis, I believe, has kind of lagged behind security analysis. We have a lot of techniques um, and approaches we, we have to, to determining whether our systems are secure, and we often design systems and we evaluate security, and then we don't even think about usability. Um, we sort of believe that new proposals, as we move forward, we, we think that the, the goal ought to be in the future that new systems, we, we, we shouldn't really even consider them seriously until they have both security and usability uh, evaluations together. You know, and we're not, we're not there yet as a community. I want to give you some examples. So, you know, 10 years ago, there were t some research in password managers, something called PWD hash and password multiplier. Uh, and these were published in top conferences done by really respected researchers. I mean, there's a lot of things I like about these systems. And in the case of PWD hash, they talked a little bit about usability in the paper. And had, had, they brought in a few users and made some comments that it would be usable. But when someone came along later and did a formal evaluation and brought in a number of users, there were some pretty strong you know, serious usability problems, okay? Uh, another case, in, in, in the password space, there's been lots of alternatives to passwords that we've been working on for a couple of decades. There's a paper called The Quest to Replace Passwords that I really recommend if you're interested in password authentication. And it goes through a lot of alternatives, biometrics, single sign-on, et cetera. And it does a heuristic evaluation of their security, usability, and deployability properties. And as we've been doing, uh, some other work we did was in uh, password authentication, and we really recognized that most of the systems on that chart had never had a, a usability evaluation done. And one of my students did, did, a, did a project where we took some systems and essentially did kind of a usability tournament to try to, to explore the usability. And, and again, we found a, a system that was published at a top uh, HCI conference that that's on paper seemed to be pretty good, but when we implemented it and actually used it, it got really poor uh, feedback from users. So, so I want to convince you, you know, we, uh, as security experts, we, we need more input from the usability experts. Um, here's just a list of some topics in security that the usability community has looked at. And if you go look in the literature, you can find examples on these topics. So uh, that might interest some of you. I'm not going to talk about those today. I did want to introduce you to what do usability uh, experts do when they evaluate a system. Here are some of the techniques that they use and that we've used a few of these in our work. They use both qualitative and quantitative uh, approaches. Very often you have to get an ethics board approval before you can, you can work with users. Again, in the United States, uh, universities require that. Uh, so here, here's some examples. A cognitive walkthrough, it's like, a, it's like a code review, except you bring in the, the system designers and some experts and you look at an interface and you methodically walk through it step by step, asking yourselves uh, some questions and kind of evaluating, thinking about uh, what, uh, from the user's point of view. And it's sort of a cheap thing that you can do early on in the design to identify some sec uh, security issues. A heuristic evaluation is we'll come up with a set of heuristics, kind of best practices or rules, and then we'll evaluate a, a system according to these heuristics. Surveys are a common way, a nice way to kind of get a broad assessment from a lot of users. And t today, a lot of folks are using Amazon Mechanical Turk to quickly re re recruit uh, people and do, and do surveys. You can do interviews, which is maybe you work with a small set of people and you sit down with them and do an in-depth interview. Uh, and let the users talk, you can kind of maybe uh, dive deep on, uh, on a topic. And grounded theory is an approach that comes from the social scientists, which is instead of uh, identifying a hypothesis and then going and testing that hypothesis, we sort of try to come in with it with, without a preconceived notion. And we talk to users and we code the data and we try to let the data sort of pr produce the theory. It's kind of the thinking. So it's kind of backwards maybe from how maybe traditional scientists think. So there are, there are, there are folks doing these kinds of studies. 
And then the last one, which I'll, I'll talk about some of our own today, is laboratory user studies. You bring users into the laboratory and you put them in front of systems and you, you watch them use it. Uh, and I'd say much of usable security, these lab studies are often kind of ad hoc. But, but we have been trying, and others have been trying to, to use some standard metrics. And there's something called uh, system usability scale that we've been using in our uh, laboratory studies to try to get some quantitative results that you can do comparisons across systems. And I'm going to refer to this SUS, these SUS scores in my talk. So let me sh uh, show you briefly what, what this system usability scale is. It's an approach where you evaluate a system, and the end result is you come up with a number that's your SUS score between 0 and 100. And it's based on the answers. Uh, when the users are done with the system, we ask them 10 questions, um, kind of a Likert scale questions, and we take uh, we sort of average these out and you get a SUS score. And this chart here shows SUS scores along the bottom. Uh, and, and sort of the chart to kind of tell you an idea, what, is this, what does it mean to have a SUS score of, say, 70 or 80? Uh, this chart is based on, there were thousands of, of user studies done with SUS. And a average, an average system gets about a 68. So 68 is about uh, kind of average. If you're, if you're getting an 80, you're in the top 15% of systems. And, and, and that's a per, uh, quite a good score. They say, the claim is if you get a score of 90, your system's almost viral. It, it, it's so easy to use and it'll, it'll really, really take off. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to this chart later uh, in the presentation. Here's the 10 sus questions. I'm not going to read them all to you, but what they are are the odd numbered questions are positive statements about the system, such as number three, I thought the system was easy to use. And the, the even questions are negative statements. Um, let's look at number uh, eight. I found the system very cumbersome to use. So users respond to these questions kind of in a strongly disagree to a strongly uh, you know, agree scale. And some folks put a lot of effort to, uh, to come up with questions that have been shown to be very uh, discriminating in terms of helping to evaluate a system. And we have found, interestingly enough, as we've, when we repeat uh, experiments, we get pretty consistent SUS scores, uh, has been our experience. Um, yes? What's the metrics you guys are using for SUS? Is there like a particular metrics you're using? Yeah, if, if you go uh, to the original paper oh, I don't this, uh, from Brooke, it'll, it'll, it'll describe it. But he's, essentially, the, he has an approach where you sum up the numbers. You have to sort of um, normalize the negative responses. So we, we sort of normalize the data, and then we, we take the average. Um, no, what I mean is, um, are you looking at more efficiency usage, learnability, memorability? Oh, what? Okay. I mean, that's what I meant. Sorry. Uh, I, I see. Yep, now yeah. I understand your question. I Thank mean, you. some yeah, of your question questions. Was, um, are we using, is this memorability, efficiency? Yes, yeah. yeah, SUS was, in, was created to sort of be independent of any application area. Okay. So people use this for all kinds of systems, using a web browser. We've done it in secure email. So, so in some sense, you can use it for all kinds of systems. But it's usually a user sitting down and using a software system to complete some sort of a tasks and then just responding about their experience. It, good questions. I, so in one sense, I'd say, yeah. Oh, the, the question is, are you looking to, is the goal, you know, adoptability? I would say w when we bring users in, there is no stated goal sort of that the user's aware of. In some sense, it's, it's, you, you might want to come and maybe study these 10 questions in more detail well, to sort of answer that. I mean, oh, our goal. Oh, okay. um, what's your goal? Oh, for, for our secure email, mm -hmm. we're partly we want to we want to create design and create a system that users consider usable okay. and ideally maybe it could be adopted but uh, but adoptability isn't as researchers that's not our primary goal okay but but we feel that a usable system is really a desirable you know element if, if, right. if it is going to be adopted in practice no, thank you yeah, very certainly. much yeah thank you thanks for working with me on that um, that's all I'm going to say sort of about the usable security area. If you're really interested in this, I just wanted to point out there's a conference called SOUPS that's been running for, about, for over a decade. And you can go there and see, see a lot of the uh, current work that's coming out. And Garfinkel and Lipford produced a book called Usable Security about in 2014. And it gives kind of a nice summary of the last decade of research. And they tell you some of the, what they see as some of the challenges. So that's kind of a nice reference uh, for you. So I want to now sort of talk about secure email, because this is the application that we have been sort of applying usable security ideas and approaches uh, uh, to exploring. So let's talk about the security of email first briefly. I mean, SMTP, the email protocol, it wasn't designed with any security in mind. Okay, So it doesn't give us anything, connection level or sort of message uh, properties. We can add TLS uh, to the protocol, and that would secure the connections. Okay, So maybe between the email client and the mail servers, or even transferring between 
uh, mail servers, but we still don't have any security guarantees at the message level. Now, DKIM is a protocol where we can digitally sign messages to give the messages integrity and authenticity. If you've heard of DKIM, when I send in a, a Gmail user, I send an email message, the Gmail will digitally sign that message, which kind of indicates that Gmail has authenticated me as a user and they're, they're uh, signing that message and others can va validate that signature. Other email servers can, can validate it. Okay, so, so these are sort of in place and they're kind of running maybe invisibly that users don't even have to, to be aware that that's happening. The question is kind of, you know, how well is this working? Just this past year, three um, you know, top conferences, three separate groups did some measurement studies where they went and looked at kind of, the, kind of the back end of how email is being transmitted on the internet and did some studies to see how well that TLS and DKIM uh, is working. And the results were sort of mixed, okay? It turns out that in, in a lot of cases it's not turned on or it's, they, they saw a lot of you know, incorrect configurations. I would say the, the major webmail providers are leading out on this, the Googles, Yahoos, and Hotmails, but so many other servers you know, haven't incorporated this. Uh, Start TLS is the, kind of the protocol to get TLS running between our connections, um, but it's, it's vulnerable to an active attack. It's kind of a best effort. Systems may try to send with TLS, but if the server doesn't respond, you know, the mail must go through, so they'll just go ahead and send it in plain text. So if an attacker can interfere and force you to, to send it in plain text. And plenty of, they found instances of where systems aren't even validating the certificate that's being presented, and so you can do impersonation attacks. Uh, DKIM, it's poorly implemented. It's not really clear what to do if a DKIM signature doesn't check out. Most of the time the mail's still delivered, maybe with a message uh, to the user. So we're only sort of partly there. They also uh, determined, you know, in some countries, what, seven countries, they said 20% of, of mail sent to Gmail is purposely being sort of downgraded. Not sure who, who, uh, who's doing that. So, so the, the system is still sort of partially there and there's, uh, there, there's some challenges. So if I go back to that list, so, so maybe you know, we're, we're, we're getting some of these properties in some cases, but it's still fragile. Um, what about end-to-end -end security, right? If Alice and Bob are communicating over email, if they would do end-to-end -end encryption, then they can get all of these properties at the message level. You know, how would they do that? Well, we have PGP and SMIME are the email um, encryption uh, standards that have been around uh, you know, for, for many years. They're not in common use, but some people use them. There have been some usability studies done on PGP and SMIME. Uh, the first one was done in 99, this why Johnny can't encrypt. And the general result is, you know, they're not very usable and users usually struggle with the key management. I mean, they don't understand what it means to have a public and private key pair. And so when the interfaces expose some of these terms, you know, users aren't confused unless they're, they've been educated. Um, there are email depots or, you know, websites that will support uh, secure email and there's a broad mix of those. In many cases, it's hard to, hard to know whether you're really getting end-to-end -end encryption. Sometimes we're trusting those services. They, they either store the messages in plain text or they, they, can, they can access the messages. So I want to say more. This Why Johnny Can't Encrypt paper that appeared, it is, it's a well-known paper. And in many, many consider it one of the seminal papers in usable security. And I want to give you the, this background. What happened is it, it was at CMU. They brought in 12 students. They, they talked to them, they, they were supposed to be in a hypothetical cam political campaign scenario, maybe this is even in our election year, so, th so they were supposed to imagine being on a political campaign and they were supposed to send secure email. So, they, so they, they, they gave them PGP with an instruction manual and their idea was can you install it and set it up and start exchanging secure email with your, your, your co-workers. And the end result was really a disaster. It turned out you know, only three of the users actually were able to send uh, correctly secure email. Half the people couldn't even get the key pairs created and get things installed to even use secure email. And there were lots of mistakes related to key management. And this paper, you know, was really prominent. It was really a wake up call to the security community uh, to sort of realize, hey, we've, we've designed this public key cryptography, which makes complete sense to us, but users struggle with the current systems. And since that time, there hasn't been much uh, progress uh, made. Um, we started doing secure e email work and it seemed like people weren't paying attention to it. I, I, my own, uh, sense is once the Snowden incident happened and sort of talk about government surveillance, this has kind of stirred up folks, researchers and users to kind of think more about securing our messages. So, so that's sort of an opportunity uh, that has come along. And in fact, the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, they have a scorecard where they list a bunch of secure messaging tools, instant messaging and some secure email tools. And they have a scorecard to help users try to understand how, and they say, how secure are the tools that we're using? 
And the interesting thing is there's nothing there about the usability of these tools. Um, and, and some of us in the community you know, have been talking about that, uh, kind of th this, this fact. So I want to talk to you now about what we've been doing uh, to, to, to sort of address this problem of usable uh, secure email. And here's the approach we've taken. Uh, given these prior studies that showed that PGP uh, was difficult to use, we wanted to, could we create a tool that had an interface that users could use to you know, correctly send messages, maybe, maybe if they at least had an understanding of who could read their messages, and they could avoid making mistakes, primarily you know, sending it, giving away their keys or sending, sending plain text when they, they were supposed to do uh, encrypted mail. And we focused on webmail. It's a prominent form of email. People hadn't really focused on that uh, in the past. It was e easy to develop prototypes sort of in, in, the, in the browser. And our idea was maybe we could learn something from that experience, some principles that we could apply uh, more, more broadly. And a big decision we made early on was we decided on automatic key management. You know, because of the experiences others have had with PGP, um, we wanted to start with something simpler. Maybe, uh, maybe arguably l less secure, but our focus was, was strongly on usability, maybe willing to make some trade-offs with uh, security. And let me, I don't know if you're familiar with identity-based encryption. Let me just give you a couple of, uh, a little, little background. This was proposed uh, long ago. In, in the last couple of decades, there's been some practical ways to, uh, to implement this idea. But the big difference between the traditional RSA public key crypto that I think you've all heard about is, in IBE, your email address can serve as your public key. And the idea is, Alice can send a message to Bob if she knows Bob's email address without Bob having done something in advance. Bob doesn't have to create you know, a cryptographic key and share it with Alice first. Right? That's been a big sort of roadblock maybe to the adoption of secure email. And, and this is kind of an intriguing idea because it potentially it breaks this chicken and egg problem of traditional public key cryptography. Right? We have the problem, I mean, I don't send encrypted email to people because I don't have their public keys and they have no motivation to go get public keys because nobody's sending them email and we're kind of at this, at this impasse. Um, the one caveat of identity-based encryption is that you, you trust a third-party key server to help to, to sort is, is, is part of the equation. The third-party key server is going to hand out the private key to Bob after Bob receives the email. Okay? You know, that's a big assumption. For some people, that, you know, that, that's kind of unacceptable. Okay? Um, but we wanted to, to explore, if, if, if we get some help to automate the key management, can we create a usable system? That was sort of our, our starting point. So we developed, we've been developing a system called Private Webmail, or POEM. And the goal is we wanted to provide you know, secure webmail for the popular webmail providers like Gmail. Could we get end-to-end -end encryption uh, between G Gmail users so that messages were protected in transit and they were encrypted at the, the, the webmail provider so Gmail wouldn't be able to read my email? And incorporating IB, the idea is could we make it really easy to start using secure email, okay, both for senders and receivers. And two of the big ideas uh, we've worked on with our focus on usability is we have this idea of, which we refer to as a security overlay. And the idea is if I think of my web page, maybe my Gmail page or my Yahoo page, if there are portions, maybe the portions where I compose the body of the email, I'm going to leave the user with their familiar interface, but I'll, I'll overlay the compose window so that when they're entering their message, they're entering it into my overlay. And we're kind of using iframes. We're going to use the browser sandbox box model. So I, ent I enter my plain text. The overlay is going to encrypt the plain text and only put encrypted content on the Gmail page. Okay, that, that's the, the kind of the high level idea. And we're going to have automatic key, uh, key management going on behind the scenes so that users don't have to explicitly manage their keys. And with this kind of a framework, the, the basic idea is we've been focusing on design features and we, we implement this feature, we do some usability eva evaluations to try to identify problems, and we've just sort of been iterating over a series of user studies. And what I want to do is talk to you about what are some of the lessons that we've learned. I don't have time to go through every study we've done, but I want to give you the high points. Uh, and maybe you could go read some of our papers if you want to get into uh, some of the de details. So the first things we've discovered we, as we've experimented with our system and others is users really like tight integration. This idea of providing secure email for, say, say for their Gmail uh, client, uh, users like that. As, composed to, as, as compared to moving and using a separate system for secure email kind of in, in conjunction with Gmail. That, you know, that, that may uh, seem obvious, but, but we've uh, experimented with this. And here's an example of a screenshot of a Gmail Compose uh, window, which we, you know, our, over, our, our system overlays and sort of augments the Gmail uh, interface. And we do this, it's implemented as a, either a browser extension or a bookmarklet. So you've got to install some software uh, uh, to get this operating. 
I want to say, so, you know, whoops, let me back up. So this is what the system looks like. If, I, if Alice wants, once I have the system installed, I type in my message and I can send an encrypted message. Now, what about when Bob receives the message? Okay, um, we, think of the, we think of two important parts to this initial message that Bob's going to receive. Say he's, he hasn't taken any steps. Maybe Alice doesn't even have to tell him uh, necessarily uh, what he's doing. The first thing is we have a personalized greeting, which means the encrypted message comes but there's a plain text part of the message that Bob can compose. And the idea here is Bob could, could put something there that gives some sort of context of what is this encrypted message and why should, or I'm sorry, Alice can, can send this, so you know, why should Bob care about it? This would be some context such as, hey, remember when we met last week? Here's that document I promised to send you. Or, so the idea would be these are people who know each other and have made, you know, that there's some sort of re reason for them to be communicating securely. You know, otherwise, this could just look like spam. And in fact, we say we're, we're kind of, it's kind of the principle of spear phishing kind of turned on its head to, can we use some context so that, you know, Alice can, or Bob can decide whether uh, to, to trust this message. So along with the sort of these uh, clear text uh, greeting, every encrypted message comes along with some extra information that sort of, uh, where if, if the receiver doesn't already have software to process the message, the user can, can see what this is. It'll say it's a, it's a poem encrypted message, and here's where you can, you know, click, click this button to, to, to understand how to, how to decrypt the message, which is essentially go to our website, install uh, the plugin so, so you can de decrypt the message. Another lesson we learned, so, so, so I'll, I'll summarize that by just saying we want, we, we include some elements to make it really easy for Alice and Bob to start using, you know, that the initial sort of bootstrap into the system is easy. So, yes. I have question. a question. Yes. So uh, this initial part that you added, which was unencrypted. Yes. So in a way, it's also kind of a privacy issue here because that can give us the uh, some information about the adversary. What is there in that message? Yes. No. No. There's a privacy issue, or it's it's an avenue for a mistake. So is it something that you started with, or you come across that during your evaluation that no, we need that, and user were finding that to be helpful? Yeah. We. This is something we included. Be partly because of, of our fear of, of, of the issue of why won't this just look like spam to a user, right? It, um, so, so it's something I, I would say, this is something we believe that we need. We include it in our tool and include it in, an, uh, uh, in, our, in our user studies. So I, I would say, yeah, this is not something that was driven by user demand. This was sort of our design decision. Um, yes? Yeah. Um, so, um, this is very different from the that mailer that the company Voltage had, right? Well, Voltage is an identity-based encryption system. Well, and they had a mailer also. They had an email yeah. facility, didn't they? Um, it's very different. I don't think it was integrated with it, Gmail. No, that, that, that's right. In fact, we did one of our user studies from a couple of years ago. We, we included Voltage in one of, one of our studies. But yeah, they're using I, IBE, but it's not tightly integrated uh, with, 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 Gmail. with Gmail. It was their own, their own... It was their own system, or you, you could receive an email message that would direct you to the, mm -hmm. the Vulti site, and you could log in and, and read your message. Okay? But it was using identity-based kind of encryption, this idea that you could send email messages without having to set up public keys in advance. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, now that we are there, I thought I'll still ask oh. the second question I had. Yes. Is that, I mean, I have multiple devices, but I'm still using the same email address. Yes. So I was just a bit concerned about that uh, reading my emails on my phone, I should be able to read my email also, on not, not only on my computer, but also on my phone. Yes. So basically that means you have to provide the same private key to both devices. Yes. It, I don't know how the authentication is working out, but maybe I can hold off that question for yeah, later. I, I would say using bookmarklets, we can today use poem on your phone if you, if, you, if you have to read it in the context of a browser, which isn't as, you know, isn't as usable, I think, as the, as, the, as the email clients that are written for phones. Uh, but yes, you could use it on your, on your browser, and basically either device has to authenticate to the key server to receive their, their private key. And I'll show you, I'll talk about how we do that here in a little bit. So another theme we've experimented with is kind of this idea of hiding security details. I would say I was sort of of the mindset when we started this project that, for, you know, that we would try to hide as many security details as possible because you know, that's a good thing. We'll make it less complicated for the user. But it turns out along the ways we, we sort of had to change my, my ideas because we ended up making some things transparent and it caused problems. 
For instance, sometimes hiding some details, we ended up with a lack of trust, or people would make mistakes, or they didn't really understand what was going on. The system seemed so, so, so magical and automated, they didn't quite you know, believe or trust it. And we found that people were trusting other systems where some of these de details were, were present. So I'll, I'll give you some examples here later, later in the talk about that. Oh, in fact, it's, it's right here. So uh, here's two cases. We tested our own system against uh, Virtue, which is another um, kind of a web-based tool. They both use key escrow. And our, both, both systems, the way you authenticate to the key escrow server is through sort of an email-based authentication. You know, sort of like when you reset your passwords and you sort of prove that you own your email account. Uh, in the case of Virtue, they took the users right to the email message from the Virtue key server and you sort of had to click on a link to say, yes, I, I own my email account. In our case, we automated that. We sort of did that authentication behind the scenes since our tool is already running in the context of their email systems. We would just catch the message as it comes from the key server and process it automatically. Um, so so they, they both have equivalent uh, security, but when users experienced both systems, they ended up sort of from the qualitative results, they ended up, they trusted the virtue system where they understood what was happening, whereas with the initial version of Poem, it seemed like no authentication uh, 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 was going on. And so it, it, it really caused us to reconsider, oh, th this extra step we thought we were doing the users a favor by not uh, bothering them with, it turned out uh, was a, presented some, some problems in whether they would trust the system. You know, that that was, was unexpected, I think, when, when I first started uh, thinking about this. Another thing that happened is kind of the issue of automatic versus manual encryption. In the process of testing some of our systems, automatic encryption is where, say, we started with the Gmail, where you just push the Gmail send button, and we would encrypt the message and send it off for you, all sort of transparently. There were other tools out there where you would have a separate tool, you would encrypt the message, and then you could cut and paste it into Gmail. Okay? When we started out, I thought, no, users do not want to go to a separate tool and cut and paste uh, and, and do a send. The automatic is much better. But it turned out that users being able to see that process, again, we, we had a system, uh, cases where they trusted the manual encryption uh, more than they, they, they did the tool that was doing, doing it automatically. And once this sort of appeared, we realized that there's some earlier work, uh, Fall in Soups 2012, did a f kind of a Facebook encrypted system, and they talked about this issue of manual versus automatic and sort of you know, raised this question. And we thought, we, we saw really a more concrete example of it uh, in the work that, uh, th th that we did. And so this uh, caused us to think uh, more about this. Um, what we ended up doing is, uh, I think I'll use this as an example to say, one problem we, we've had is if you take two different email systems that have completely inter different interfaces and approaches, we did a test of them. And in, in one case, the manual encryption system seemed to be trusted more than the, the, the POEM system. And we thought, well, then maybe we better put manual encryption into POEM. But there were also some other factors. When, when, when we talked to users, there were other minor issues that, that, that came up, and it caused us to sort of think about, well, is the problem really related to manual encryption, or is it more uh, subtle than this? And there's a problem here. You know, when, you, when you test two systems, you, you can sort of say one system scored better than the other system, but being able to figure out, well, why it did is maybe a hard question to answer when the systems have lots of differences in their interfaces, um, in, in their warning messages, and things like this. So what, what we tried to do, uh, at this point, and we're trying to do this more and more, is we took our POEM tool and we made some improvements for some of the things we, we noticed on tutorials and delayed encryption. I'll talk about that here in a minute. But so so, so we, we, we made some subtle changes based on feedback. And then we implemented an automatic and a manual encryption version of POEM so that users would try two different options with exactly the same interface. And the only difference would be the item that we were studying. So they'd become a, you know, a more proper A-B test. And once we had accounted for some other differences, it turned out automatic versus manual encryption, there wasn't a, you know, a significant difference between, between the studies. And this sort of helped us learn, learn a kind of important principle that, that um, in many cases, we, we need to try to get to, to proper sort of A-B testing. If, you re, if we really want to, s to study you know, certain aspects of a system and really try to make a, a decision of what's usable or not, comparing two different systems is, is, is very coarse-grained. So, so we've been kind of moving to try to do more fine-grained uh, experiments. Here were some of the improvements we made to this POEM system um, based on our earliest studies. The first was tutorials. First, when you went to the website to install our tool, we put a nice short video. We, we, we made it very prominent on the web page. We, we hoped users would watch that video. It was short. If they watched that video, they should easily be able to do the system. And nobody watched the video. They all installed the extension and tried to go use it. And a few, if they got stuck, then they'd go back and, and look at the video. Okay? So we were, we were disappointed about, uh, about that. In our next 
in our current system, we don't have this tutorial on, on the website. We've taken the key elements from the tutorial and we've tried to integrate it right into the tool. So that the first time you use the tool, it walks you through the steps and it'll give you some, some clear instructions. And we try to make it, you know, sort of unobtrusive as natural as we can. And it ended up, it led to better understanding of the system and, and, and users were, were paying attention to, uh, to these details. Um, we also made the, the UI design more clear. I said we, we, we first tried to do, do overlays and we wanted to keep the user experience so that your Gmail page looked very much like your Gmail page. But, but if, we made it, if we made them too similar, the differences didn't stand out and they might think, oh, I've turned on encryption and they'll send their message and whoops, they made a mistake. They didn't actually toggle the button to turn encryption on. So we, we made a clearer design where we, we highlight buttons uh, and we, we changed the send message to say send encrypted and, and highlighted it to make it more uh, uh, dis distinct and we made the overlay you know, a, a distinctly different color to try to help people have a, you know, have, a, have a clear notion of when I'm in encrypted mode and when I'm in not encrypted mode. And the last thing we did, I mentioned when originally we did automatic encryption, to the users it happens so fast, they don't believe that encryption uh, happens fast. They think encryption must, it must require a, a, a lot of work. And so they weren't even sure, did the system actually encrypt my message? So we put, a, we put a delay in the system. When we go to send a message, we pop up a window and we, we, pop, we, we make it stay there for about a second and say that we're encrypting. And in fact, we, we, t we say who we're encrypting it for to help drive home the point that this is being encrypted for a particular user. Because some users, the system worked, they, some users thought, well, anyone who installs the tool can read this message, right? Because, the key, you know, because all the, the encrypted details were hidden. And so just putting, putting this message there uh, made a difference. In our subsequent studies, this issue's never uh, come up like it did uh, uh, in original studies. So that, that was something that uh, surprised us. Um, what I want to do now is sort of summarize, now that I've told you some of the high level details, I want to just summarize um, you know, sort of three of the studies we've done and I'm going to really focus on the most recent one because there's some interesting things uh, we've been do doing lately. And in the studies we've done, uh, a number of studies, we've evaluated our own research prototypes and we've compared it against some other systems that are out there, some commercial uh, and re research systems. And we've, we've gotten some quantitative measures using that system usability scale, and we, we, we count mistakes that people make. And we get qualitative measures by um, asking free response survey questions and interviewing uh, the participants after they're done with the study. In our first studies, where we took our poem that was tightly integrated with Gmail, and we took Voltage, okay, the IB tool you, you were mentioning, um, which is more of a mail depot tool and some standalone tools. And we did an, you know, a number of studies with these systems. And the idea was users would come in and be given some tasks, a scenario, and they were exchanging email you know, with us. We were sort of the, acting as the study uh, coordinator. And these initial uh, results is where, where, where we really learned that people like in integrated systems. Uh, at first, at first, we thought that manual encryption was maybe preferable to uh, automated encryption. That, that's what mot motivated our study. You know, we first learned this on two very, very different tools, so then we wanted to do a more, um, you know, proper A-B test. Um, and uh, some other systems, in the case of Voltage or in Cypher, they got, they got pretty low SUS scores. They had, you know, some confusing interfaces. And maybe in the case of Voltage, that's where, by comparison, people didn't like the idea of having to go to a mail depot to, uh, to read their messages. When we did our second study, this is where we created the two variants of POEM and did a proper A-B test. The one thing, we, we sort of expanded our task so that we were, we were simulating you know, a company sending me secure email or, or, or sending me an email and requesting that, uh, you know, maybe like during a hiring process, I have to send back my, my uh, uh, you know, information to be hired. And we also simulated sort of a grassroots adoption of now that the user is using secure email, suppose they, had to they wanted to exchange a sensitive message uh, w with their spouse, what would they do to, to get someone else to, uh, to, to return them a secure email message? And that was sort of our first attempt to sort of study what, what we're calling sort of grassroots adoption. And this was the test where we decided, no, there isn't a, a significant difference between manual and automated encryption once you account for other confounding factors. Uh, the POEM score here was, was uh, an 80, which is the highest score we've seen on any secure, the, the secure email tools we've uh, explored. And the, uh, one significant thing, in our early studies, about 10% of the users would make an error along the way, which is they'd, they, they'd forget to turn on, you know, they thought encryption was on when it was not. Uh, with the, this latest system, that got cut down to 1%. So that was the, you know, we saw a significant uh, reduction. Here are a couple things we observed about our users that caused us to, to do something different in our next study. 
And first, users became, they were sort of impatient during the study. You know, if they'd send off a message and we'd say, wait, you know, you know sort of wait for the coordinator to do something, you know, they could, they'd sit there on that inbox in Gmail just kind of, kind of clicking it. Or, you know, the, we, we, we consider that they, they looked at, uh, sort of agitated. And this, this grassroots, grassroots adoption process, uh, that the feedback was, it, it didn't seem very realistic to them. So here's what we've done on one of our most recent studies. And I want to spend just a little more time on this, this study. This, is, um, th this study uh, is going to appear in the CHI conference, which is sort of the top uh, HCI conference uh, coming up here in a month. It's getting an honorable uh, mention award. And there's a couple things we've done that are sort of uh, that are novel that I want to highlight. Um, and the primary thing is we did our user study in a very different way th than anyone has done before, is we went out and recruited pairs, two people. We asked. We asked two friends to come to our study. Because this email, you know, the, the idea that two users would decide to use secure email and have to cooperate to send a message, we, we, we say we call this a two-body problem. And so we, we thought, hey, it's inherently a two-body problem. We ought to bring in two people and see if they really can adopt secure email in a grassroots fashion. So we bring these friends in there. We, we still gave them a hypothetical scenario. We had sort of a, a scenario of you're, you're, you're helping your friend with taxes. So we're sending some financial uh, information. We sort of based that scenario on it, you know, surveying users of what they thought were some interesting uses for secure email that they would use. And so we brought them in and gave them the, these tasks. And so we, we put them in separate rooms. We told them they could phone each other. Um, and one was given the task of uh, you know, sending a secure message. We didn't tell them that the study was about secure email. We recruited people and said, are you a Gmail user? And then we would put them in the room and then they were, they were, we would basically give them the scenario and point them at the tool and just see, see what they could do on their own without any training from us. So we did a study, um, it's, a with, it's, it's called a within subject studies, where we brought the users in and we initially wanted them to, do, to try four tools. Our POEM tool, Tutanota, which is a mail depot tool, and Virtue, which is kind of an integrated uh, mail depot hybrid. So we tried three different kinds of systems. You know, one of them is, was a system we, we designed. And then we wanted to, to do a PGP tool. So Mail the Lope is a Gmail extension to do PGP. It's touted as being usable. And we, we were sort of curious, have we, have we made any progress on why Johnny can't encrypt? So we originally were going to have people try all four tools. And we did a pilot study. We brought a few people in to try Mail the Lope. And they, none of the, it looked, it look, it looked uh, like not very promising. And we, we, we thought there's not enough time for people to do all four. So, so we, we took Mail the Lope off to the side and did sort of our own study uh, with it. Sort of, we were sort of anticipating the results wouldn't be uh, promising. Um, so we bring these participants in, we call them Johnny and Jane now, kind of following our Why Johnny Can't Encrypt. And the first participant is, is asking, uh, you know, Jane for help with, with taxes. Um, Johnny's told to encrypt his message and Jane just learns about it by getting the message and with the instructions that come along with the, with the message. So we brought in 25 pairs of participants or 50 total people to, to test these three tools. And then we brought in 10 pairs to try this PGP tool as, as a separate study. Um, so here's our POEM system I've mentioned before that's, that's got automatic encryption and is an extension, you know, kind of tightly integrated with Gmail. Uh, Tutanota is a, an email depot, which means they're, they're, they're sort of a, a, you know, a website is acting as the, uh, you know, email server. And it'll, it will allow PGP. And if you don't already have PGP keys, it allows you to create a password to encrypt your, your message with a password. And the idea is you're going to share that with whoever's re receiving the email. And this is a, a commercial uh, system. And Virtru is another system that's tightly integrated with Gmail that has a, you know, kind of a custom uh, key escrow scheme. And so if, if, if the recipient installs Virtru, uh, um, it'll, it'll use the key escrow. And if the recipient maybe isn't using browser for their email, they can log into the, to a depot and read the message. So they sort of have, have the choice. And to summarize the results, I, you know, I encourage you to read the paper if you'd like to, to read all the details uh, and the user feedback. But uh, you know, Palm was the favorite system. Uh, m more people uh, selected that as they like this tightly integrated approach. But both Virtue and Palm, the two tightly integrated systems, had very similar, almost equivalent SUS scores. And the interesting thing, there were no, no mistakes uh, in all the tasks uh, that they did. This Tutanota, uh, this depot system, you know, again, we're, we're seeing a consistent uh, feedback that users, users uh, dislike this. Uh, the interesting one was Mailvelope. This, I mentioned this PGP tool. We, we, we studied that off to the side. Uh, kind of like before, we, we brought in these 10 participants. Only one of the pair was able to exchange secure email within 45 minutes. And the one that did, one of the users said they had used PGP before. So I think they had a, an idea of what public key crypto. It still took them nearly 45 minutes to accomplish the tasks. Um, 
And the, the, one, the, the one fun comment, it, in the surveys and the people's comments afterwards, one of the users, after struggling with mail below for a long time, their comment was, imagine the stupidest software you would ever use. And that was what I was doing. So um, uh, it's, uh, we still haven't progressed, uh, you know, kind of since the Y Johnny uh, Canton crypt. So we really, uh, one thing we learned, we, we, we like this two-person uh, uh, approach to studying email. And the one is, we thought people kind of behave naturally. I mentioned before, people seem to be sort of agitated and impatient when we had them with a study. Here it was, since they, they knew their friend was doing something, people were pretty relaxed. They went off and they, we told them they could do the same computer. They went off and read Facebook for a while or they just sort of did some internet task and they seemed to be uh, patient. And also the interesting thing before, if something, if there was a problem in the study, sometimes in our study, maybe, maybe our, our, our setup was wrong and, and, and the coordinator's email, the, the mistake was with something the coordinator did. Well, usually they sort of assumed I mean, a study, it should all work perfectly. You know, if there's a problem, I'm the source of the problem. But people here, when mistakes happen, they were, oh, well, maybe my partner made a mistake. They were a little more open to what might have, uh, have caused this issue. And when afterwards, we explained to them how we had done prior studies and what did they feel, how did they feel coming into this two-person study? Now, they, you know, they, they didn't participate in a prior study, but they made comments like, well, oh, I didn't really feel like I was as under the microscope. You know, I, I was working with, with, with my friend and uh, uh, someone said, it's, it's kind of like, hey, we're on the same page. Neither of us you know, know, know what we're doing. So that was kind of some interesting feedback. It's kind of qualitative uh, feedback, but, but we're really interested in continuing doing some more studies sort of with this approach. Um, I'll do, so we've, we, we've done a number of studies. Here's just the number, you know, the tools that we've used and their SUS scores. And, you know, in general, I mean, the, the scores in the 70s or 80s are, you know, respectable scores. Uh, the depot systems definitely don't, don't score well. You know, mailvelopes still still kind of off the chart. Um, you know, very very low uh, for the moment. Um, so so this this integrated system. We, you know, we've done an iterative design and we've learned some things. We're able to get. We've we've got kind of a high quantitative score for for poem in the laboratory. And the other thing that's been interesting is the users using that system. They they've been telling us, can I download this tool and use it? Um, in the last study, we had one question where we asked them, do you think your friends and family could use this tool? And many people answered positively, yeah, I think my... Um, so, so they were you know, encouraged from their initial lab uh, uh, experience. I want to tell you, so from where we're at, here's some interesting directions that we plan on ta uh, taking this work. I mean, by using automatic key management, you know, we've got a system that we believe has done respectable in the lab. You know, laboratory settings are still, I think, limited because we bring people in and it's sort of a short duration, kind of a one-time exposure. We'd now like to uh, deploy this tool and get some, some long-term studies where we give this tool to users and let them use it over an extended period of time. It'd be interesting to see if, you know, on their own, will they use it for their daily tasks? And if they use it over the long haul, is there anything about the system that will become, you know, unpleasant to them, right, or cause them to, uh, to stop using it? Right? Will, will the tutorials become a nuisance? Right? Do they need an expert mode, as, as an example? The other thing we've realized, by thinking more carefully about these A-B studies, um, you know, we have an IBE-based system working pretty well, but we're now very curious about, can we get a PGP system working better if we take some of the lessons we've learned and maybe integrate it into Mailvelope, as, as one example? Or what, what we're really going to do is we're going to take POEM. Um, we've already made the key management framework sort of pluggable, and we'd like to take a single system and try an IBE system and maybe plug in PGP or this, even this password-based kind of encryption that some of the tools are doing. Put the key management options in a single tool and then do an A-B comparison. So we might really be able to, to draw some conclusions about what are the usability differences between these key management alternatives. Because if you do it between two separate tools, there's just too many confounding factors that can creep in. And so we'd, you know, I'm hoping, you know, in the, in the next year, I can come back to you. Can we create a more usable PGP, or is there just something inherent about that model that, is, that, 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 that we're just never, never going to get there? I think, we're, I think we, we feel like we're sort of poised and in a good position to, to try to tackle that question and, uh, and answer that. Um, so that, that, that's uh, sort of the overview. I don't, if you've got some other questions we can talk about, I'd be happy to answer. Well, if nobody else, I've got a couple. Um, <coughs> First, uh, how do you handle sent, uh, like saving a copy of your own sent mail? Is that? Oh, um, yes. For our Gmail system, you know, as you know, if you're composing a message in Gmail, you know, it, it will save drafts. 
So that's that's one reason we have this the security overlay. So once you're in the security overlay, you know that we never we only put encrypted content onto the page. So if drafts are saved, it's it's the encrypted. You know, in case of poem, you know, uh, in, only encrypted drafts are saved. But um, if that's encrypting with the recipient's public key, we we also you know we're in underneath we're encrypting the message with AES, and then okay. you know you, you you use the the public key to encrypt the. The symmetric key. So you act, you keep. We keep our own key. And and you uh, do keep that permanently. Permanently, yep. Okay. Yes. So yep. Uh, yeah, good question. Yes. So uh, I I wanted to ask. I mean, excellent. I mean, I really enjoyed it. I I was more uh, wanted to ask a security kind of a question. Sure. Uh, so the, when you provide these private keys for the decryption of the message to the your thing. Probably they're going to f uh, flow through the Gmail only, right? Because that's the authenticated medium, similar to the uh, like password reset. Yes. So here, I ask for the private key, and I get a reply as a, a G uh, email on my Gmail account with the private key. But that message will be unencrypted, right? Because oh, it should be done. Yep. Okay. G so um, so still Gmail. In principle, if they decide, they can decrypt my yeah. message because. So the way we've implemented, yeah. let, let me say this: Gmail, as uh, I'll explain how we do it. The high-level idea is Gmail, as a passive observer, uh, can't decrypt the message because we don't send the encrypt, you know, the, the decryption key in, in plain text. But because we're doing email authentication, Gmail, as an active attacker, could impersonate me and 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 get the key server to get to give them a key so so i'll tell you this this is how it's done when we go to authenticate to the key server we're using a protocol that we publish in one paper called saw sort of a simple authentication for the web and the idea is this i go to the the key server through ssl to authenticate and the key server is going to create a token and split it into two parts they'll give one part to me over the ssl connection in my browser and will email the other part so what goes in the plain text email is sort of you know half of a secret if I combine, and, and a passive observer getting that by itself can't do anything with it. If, I, if we go retrieve the message, when the message goes back, both tokens go back uh, to the um, uh, key server, and then we get the private key over an SSL connection with the, with, uh, with the key server. Okay? So, 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 we're, so we're using e you know, email-based authentication, which is a, you know, it's a, it's a, a low-barrier way to authenticate. It'll thwart a passive attacker the way we've done it, but it. But if Gmail turned around and wanted someone at Gmail wanted to run a session, they, they could they could be an active attacker. Yeah, I, I got what you. So, so yeah, you know, and, and then then what you can do. So so, so I, I'd say we we chose that again. I mentioned how we were sort of doing security usability trade offs. We we sort of try to make it easier for the user, so there's no extra passwords or secrets the user has to know. We could start strengthening that authentication to the the email server by. Creating a password at the email server, or, do, or doing you know two-factor authentication, you could ratchet up the authentication to an IBE server to improve the system, and then you'd have some, you'd be making some more security usability trade-offs. So in this sense, it's it's not Google that's really the attacker; it's DOJ subpoenaing Google. That's yeah, yeah, it's DOJ saying <laughs> Google, help us out here. You get the key. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yep. I. I had another, which was, there was something in a slide there <laughs> that I didn't quite understand. Talked about the user interacting with the encrypt, encrypted message. Uh, oh. I'm just imagining, oh, I want to make these edits to the encrypted, oh. <laughs> to the cyber yes. text. Uh, yep. I um, think. What, what, what sort of interaction, I mean, is that just seeing the cipher text or is there actually something else? Yeah, it, it was, I know which, um, I think this was back to the kind of manual versus automatic encryption. Um, Let's see. Yeah, and optionally interact with the cipher text. So yes, you were um, the tool experiment. Maybe at, at simple terms, it would be that they get to see the message. But th there was a tool we ex experimented with where it's, it's a tool I'll take and I'll I'll do encryption, and the cipher text will be there, and then you have to cut and paste it into say Gmail if you want to send it through Gmail. So maybe instead of interact, think of you know you can see the cipher text, or you have to m move it. You know, cut cut and paste it. Okay. That's the interacting we we're talking yeah. about. So. Yeah. Which would seem low on the usability scale, high on the trust scale, but probably. Yeah, I mean, I when the student first proposed this, I, I thought, oh, that'll get terrible scores, and then I was really surprised when, when users didn't outright outright reject it. 
And it was, and that, that was where, in, in talking with the, the, they understood what was happening. Now, that would be another one. They, you know, they said that in the lab. That might be another one. If, if they had to actually do that regularly on a regular basis, they, they might feel different after a long-term study. But I, I was surprised by that laboratory result that, that, that users, you know, users saw two, two variations and they gave it similar. It had a, it had a nearly identical SUS score. So that, that actually kind of surprised me and made, made me start, start rethinking some of my earlier assumptions. I would say that that's kind of one takeaway I would say from this that you know coming at this problem from a, a, as a system security researcher you know I made some assumptions what I thought users would do and there were a number of instances where you, you know it, it, it surprised me and that, that's just maybe just another indication that we have to sort of realize as, as security researchers we, we just can't predict that, and, and think that we know everything about users and that's why it's so important to involve them you know kind of in our system design and creation because you know we're not going to get it right on every assumption we make. Are there any other? Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Siemens.